BGMC. The biblical truth lives here. scriptures foretold of the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach. The Messiah Yeshua came to call the people back to the truth of His word and to follow that righteous path. Yeshua then called Jewish men to be His disciples, and after His death and resurrection, those Jewish men told the world about the Jewish Messiah. Now, after 2,000 years, Beth Goyim Messianic Congregation has that same calling of those Jewish men telling all people, both Jew and Gentile, about the proper ancient path, teaching the Route 66 King's Highway from Genesis through to Revelation, and how you need and can get back to the proper roots of the faith and a closer walk with God. Now, let's hear the message. Let's go get a blessing. Turn to the book of Bamidbar, Numbers 35, Numbers 35, verse uh, 9 through 12, verse nine, uh, Numbers Bamidbar 35, verse 9 through 12. This is recorded message E312, E312. This is Prosh, number 43, Matzah A, it comes from Bamidbar, um, uh, chapter 33 through chapter 36. There's a lot of information. Um, we're not going to be going over all the names, although if you want to have a fun study uh, in this prosh, when all the names, you, you look up the name and each family name has a sentence, okay? So we're, as we've been doing this parashas and everything else like that, uh, I try to pick a, a parash that, um, uh, a portion of the parash, parash meaning portion of the Torah, of that reading that we're doing, that really un, um, uh, speaks about... Um, what the whole parash is about. So Numbers, Bamidbar 35, verse 9 through 12. Bamidbar 35, verse 9 through 12. Jehovah said to Moshe, Tell the people of Israel, when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, you are to designate for yourself cities that will be cities of refuge for you, which anyone who kills someone by mistake can flee. These cities are to be a refuge for you from the dead person's next of kin, who might otherwise avenge the kinsman's death by slaying the killer prior to his standing trial before the community. Amen? So as you see the picture up, up there, above, right above my head, okay, there's a, um, a pencil uh, erasing the word mistake. In this particular part that we're looking at to start off, that's the whole parash. The Lord does not want people to die in sin. That is not his goal. Look, ha, ha, that one's dead. Ha, ha, that one's dead. That's zap, zap, zap. That's not Jehovah's goal. His goal is to have you repent to Shuva and come back home. Okay? Now, in this particular part that we're looking at for the whole parash, um, we're looking at the city of refuge. Uh, in verse 11, you are to designate for yourself cities that will be cities of refuge for you to which anyone who kills someone by mistake can flee. Okay, and we're going to go through in, in the prosh what is a mistake. You know, if you say, oh, I'm going to get that so-and-so, that's not a mistake. Okay, so the key here is that the Lord wants to forgive. He wants to forgive mistakes, and you have an opportunity to flee to a city, not like we have here in America, these cities of refuge that are housing uh, all people that don't really belong in the country, and, you know, actually we have a whole state, which is a city, a state of refuge in California. I think we should release California from the United States and let them pay for all the people themselves. Hey, that'll work well, don't you think, since most, uh, uh, anyway. So let's go on to the next slide. Let's go on to the parash. Let's begin the parash. Uh, Bamidbar 33, Numbers 33, verse 1 and 2. Bamidbar 33, verse 1 and 2. These are the stages of the journey. The people of Israel, as they left the land of Egypt, divided groups under the leadership of Moshe and Aaron. Moshe recorded each of the stages of their journey in order uh, of Jehovah. Here are the starting points of the stage. Amen? So here, um, it's a really good map. Um, what 
you're looking at in the map that's on the picture there um, is knowing your history so that you follow a good road. See, you see, you know, they go one, two, three, four, you know, one through 11, and then they, they go around the mountain, the wilderness of Zin and Kadesh Barnet. Okay, that big circle thing there. Looks like a gigantic teardrop. Okay, so the reason that the Lord has these stages is so that we can see good and we can see bad. Okay, you always want to have retrospect on your life. You want to remember the bad things and you want to remember the good things. Okay, because when you're going down a road um, and you make a mistake, you want to remember that so that you never go back there again. It's one of the things about why we have the holy days. The holy days is not really victories over our enemies, but like, you know, Pesach, it's, it's redemption from the Lord. But the next question that's really never taught in, in uh, regular Jewish synagogues and even in my yeshiva that I went for, to, for years, is the question was never answered, why? Why were we in Egypt for 400 years? What caused us to be slaves for 400 years since we're God's chosen people? Okay, now here, if we're, what we're looking at in Bamidbar 33 is the path. You know, we would have gotten to the, to the promised land a lot quicker had we not made the mistakes. Okay, so you see the 17 stages in this picture, okay, you know, it should have been a two-week journey from what I've gathered from the rabbis, and, you know, this is, you know, something that they tried to figure out, you know, this many people walking, this many miles per day, it should have taken them two to three weeks, but here it took 40 years, okay, so here, the stages in your journey, you know, a lot of people don't keep a journal, but you might want to, because, um, and, you know, it's, I know diaries are for girls, diaries are for girls, well, the Bible is not for girls only, Okay, and it's a diary of what happened. Okay, so here in the stages, you learn what went right and what went wrong. Okay, you know, they started out in Goshen. Okay, and it was interesting that Israel captured the Sinai Peninsula. Okay, you look at the part where the Goshen, that's uh, the wadi is where it comes down, where it l looks like veins coming down. There's one vein and it splits off into a bunch of veins there. Okay, it splits off into one, two, three, uh, four, five, uh, six, six different uh, split offs. That's called the, the wadi, okay, where it floods. Okay, that's where the Jewish people lived in Goshen. Okay, and that's where they found the lost city of Goshen also. Um, and Israel captured all, all the Sinai Peninsula right across where we, we, we uh, went, went uh, across with number three. Okay, so we left Goshen, and we went to Sukkot and Pahakirot, and then we crossed over. Okay, so here we want to remember the road that we traveled. Okay, because when we walk with God, we walk a good way. When we don't walk with God, we don't walk a good way. Let's go on to the next slide. Let's go on to the next part. Let's look at verse 3 and 4 now. Bamidbar, Numbers 33, verse 3 and 4. They began their journey from Ramesses in the first month, on the 15th day of the first month, the morning after Pesach. The people of Israel left proudly in view of the Egyptians, uh, while the Egyptians were burying those among them whom Jehovah had killed, all their firstborn. Jehovah had executed judgment on their gods. Amen? So one of the things we look at in verse 3 is, once again, we're referencing the first, uh, the first day that we're leaving. And what that day is, is the 15th day of the first month. The 15th day of the first month. That is Hag Matzah. Okay? That is the same day that Yeshua went to the cross. All right? And um, we're leaving proudly. That we're walking with our God. We're walking out of slavery. No, no, um, no military has gotten us free except the Lord and his military, okay? Um, the other part that we're fo focusing on is in verse 4, while the Egyptians were burying th those among them whom Jehovah had killed, all the firstborn, Jehovah had also executed judgment on their gods. Okay, one of the things you want to learn in this is that Jehovah, if you are following other gods, if you're following other gods, you will sooner or later have to face judgment. You might not even face judgment in this life, but there is a next life. So here, Jehovah had done it, and he had killed all the firstborn of the Egyptians. So once again, you ask yourself, why are we looking at this again? What is the purpose? Okay, 
Um, they, they left uh, from Ramesses. Okay, Ramesses, I think it's probably on the next slide. That's the definition. It means a child of the sun. Okay, so we're following the sun because God killed the child of the sun. Okay, their sun god. Okay, which is the Sunday worship. That's where you get the sun god, that Constantine. It comes from Egypt. Okay, when you do, and it's very clear right there. And when you look up what Ramesses means, okay, it's a child of the sun. Okay, and it's very interesting that who was leading us in the desert, the angel that has God's name in him. And we all know that that's Yeshua in our study. And if you don't believe me, um, you know, we got it on the website. Okay, there's only almost 2,000 videos there. Uh, you know, one day maybe soon we'll <laughs> get a search engine. But the, you go to messianicstudent.org and it takes you right to the education sec sec section. Okay, so we're leaving the day after Pesach. And, okay, it's the day after Pesach, it says in verse 33, not day two of Pesach. Okay, it's another silly thing that the rabbis say. Day two of Pesach. I don't see it. And here in Bamidbar 33, verse 3, look at that again. They began their journey from Ramesses to the first month of the 15th day of the first month, the morning after the Pesach. Okay, the morning after the Pesach, the people, left is, uh, the people of Israel left proudly in view of the Egyptians. Amen? So here, it is in second day of Pesach. Okay, a lot of Jews, you know, I mean, even Orthodox, you know, are you coming for second night of Passover? My mother used to say. It's like, Ma, there is no second night of Passover. It's called Hag Matzah. And yes, I'll be down. Okay. Not anymore because she's not around. All right. So here, lesson one to be learned, 15th day of the month. What is another 15th day of the month? When Yeshua went to the cross. He goes to the cross to free the world from slavery. Okay. Number, lesson number two. It is the day after Pesach, so if you're following traditional Judaism, which is doing Yom Kippur on the wrong night, okay, don't follow them, follow God, okay, because the, the Hebrews, the Chabad, and the Haredi, and those Orthodox in Israel did not sight the moon, they did it scientifically, and what happened, maybe, when the asteroid hit the moon, going 66,000 miles an hour, it probably moved it, and plus, it was only the 29th day of the month. And yes, the moon can be sighted, but rarely on the 29th day. Okay? And lesson number three. Okay? Um, Jehovah executed judgment on their gods. So one of the things that we want to do is make sure you're not compromising the word of God in your life where you make people gods. A lot of things, uh, what I've m l learned ministering to a lot of Latino uh, people, um, I'm amazed how much, the, the especially divorce women, how much the son becomes the father in the house. And the, mo and the mothers treat their sons as if they're, they're gods. Okay? It's, it's quite amazing. In, in Judaism, that never happens. The mother usually gets treated like the queen. Okay? Going on to the next slide. Going on to the next slide. Uh, we turn to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. When did Yeshua go to the cross? What day on the calendar was that? Mark 15, verse 25. Mark 15, verse 25. It says, It was nine in the morning when they nailed him to the stake. Amen. What did we read in, in Bamidbar? They left proudly in the morning. Okay. So here Yeshua goes to the, the, the cross on the 15th day of the month, because remember, he had Pesach, the last supper, the last supper with his Talmudin, okay? And he washed their feet, and he raised them up to be rabbis, into the priesthood, and he goes to Gethsemane, and then he goes through all the trials at night, back and forth, back and forth, and then he goes to the cross when? Nine in the morning. Why did he go nine in the morning? Because in Bamidbar, Numbers 33, verse 3, uh, the morning after Pesach, Israel left proudly. So here Yeshua is going to the cross at 9 in the morning. This is why you see these little um, tidbits of information, these little things that show that Yeshua was fulfilling many things in the Torah, many things in the Torah. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Let's go back to Bamidbar 33, verse 38 and 39. Bamidbar 33. 
verse 38 and 39. Somebody's been biting that moon there. Okay. At, at Jehovah's order, Aaron the Cohen went up to, to Mount Hor. And he died there in the first day of the fifth month, in the 40th year after the people of Israel had left the land of Egypt. Aaron was 123 years old when he died on Mount Hor. Amen. Now, here's the, the first thing. Well, you know, the, the pagans, you know, say, you know, well, it says in Genesis that man was only supposed to live to be 120. Yes, that's the, the rule. But there are exceptions to the rule. Okay, Aaron got a little bit more time because he had to live to be the 40th year. 40 in Hebrew is the number of completion. Okay, and Aaron is not getting to see the promised land because he didn't stop his brother, Moshe, from hitting the rock twice. He didn't say anything. And I think a little bit of the, the it just popped out you know, had a, a little thing to do it. And he also came against Moshe with his sister, sister Miriam. Okay? Now, the, this is, uh, the book of Numbers is good for time frame reference. Okay? So when you're reading, like, Exodus, you know, and you're reading De Deuteronomy, Devarim, which we're, we're starting this, uh, this particular week because this is the last parash of the book of uh, Bamidbar Numbers. Okay? It helps you to get a time frame. Like in tomorrow's message that we're going to be talking about, we're going to be going through ne a little bit of Nehemiah and Ezra, okay, in message uh, 656, okay? So when, now to get a little bit more of that, you need to read Esther and Kings and Chronicles so you can get a reference to what's going on. The same goes here, okay? So Aaron, we know that Aaron is now going to die. Look at verse 38. And Jehovah ordered Aaron, the Cohen, went up on Mount Hor and died there on the first day of the fifth month, of the 40th year after the people of Israel left the land of Egypt. Amen? Now, this is also very good, this, pet, this verse, because there's a whole lie out there that the people of Israel were only in the desert 38 years. I remember in the beginning of the ministry, I had this whole argument with people. I'm like, are you stupid? You know, I, I, I like that word because Yeshua says to Kepha, are you so dull? Okay. And that's saying you're stupid. I mean, if you just read the Torah, it gives you the information. It's like, no, you, you, you twit, okay? It's very clear that they were in the desert here 40 years. So mark that in your Bible, underline verse 38, and put a tab in it so that you know when somebody says, well, the Israel was only in the desert 38 years. No, okay? It's very clear, very, 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 very clear, okay? And Aaron dies in the 40th, in the fifth month, okay? In the month of grace, okay, the, the priesthood gets passed on to the next person, okay? He has completed his time, and there's many different reasons why he um, died at that point, but you see, he's 123. So we got an extra couple of years, a little bit over what people were supposed to get, all right? And it's the fifth month. Five is the number of grace, all right? Hold your place there, and let's turn to the weathermen. Let's turn to the book of Ezra. Because in the book of Ezra, chapter 7, in the book of Ezra, you know, you get, it was the rainy season and people were distressed. Okay? So it's a weather report. Ezra 7, verse 8 through 10. We're keen here in, uh, we're looking at the fifth month. Sorry, dinner was good. A little stringy on the meat. My wife cooked a good meal today. It was very, very tasty. Um, and then for Yom Kippur, we're going to have the men do the offering and bring the grill downstairs. And we're going to send up smoke to the Lord. All right. Ezra 7, verse 8 through 10. You can't do that. Ezra arrived in Yerushalayim in the fifth month of the seventh year of the king. He began going up to the Yerushalayim from Babel the first day of the first month and arrived on the first day of the fifth month since the good hand of Elohim was on him. For Ezra had set his heart on studying and practicing the Torah of Jehovah and teaching Israel the laws and rulings. Amen? So here Aaron the Kohen, the first Kohen, goes up to be with the Lord or wherever he is because we don't know if he's in heaven or not. 
Okay, I would think he is, but I can't prove that from Scripture. He dies on the first day of the fifth month. Ezra, and here we are in uh, Persia, and we are taken away in the Exodus. Okay, and this is where you get the book of Esther and the book of Nehemiah. Okay, Ezra arrives when? Look at verse 9. He began going up to Jerusalem on, uh, from Babel on the first day of the first month and arrived the first day of the fifth month since the good hand of Elohim was on him. Amen. So here the Lord brings another Cohen to teach the laws, the laws which are good, and we are 100% legalistic. Aha! Okay. And so here the Lord is wanting the people to draw close. So he sends another uh, man of God, a man who fears God, a man that knows that people have compromised the word, and he wants to come. If we look at verse 10, for Ezra had set his heart on studying and practicing the Torah of Jehovah and teaching Israel the laws and rulings. Amen? The remnant that was there, the remnant that was in distress, he wanted to teach them because they were doing things wrong, but there was a remnant that would have not bound themselves to the nations, and now Ezra has arrived on the first day of the fifth month, the same day Aaron went, died, and the, the, Kohenim, the Kohen Haggadol position was passed on to the next person. Okay, so the Lord is always doing things. So you look at these things and you go, okay, when the fifth month rolls around, is there something going to change? Okay, there, these are some of the nuances that are nice to know. You don't really need to know them. But for those that are further along in their walk with the Lord, it helps to solidify, you know, fills in the nooks and crannies. Sort of like, you know, the cherry on top of a banana split. Okay? You don't really need it, but it really does make it taste a little bit better. Okay? Sort of like the extra garlic on a white garlic pie. All right, going on to the next slide. Let's go back to the book of Numbers. Numbers 33, verse 51 to 56. Numbers, Bamidbar 33, verse 51 to 56. To tell the people of Israel, when you cross the Yarda in the land of Canaan, you are to expel all the people living in the land from in front of you. Destroy all their stone figures. Destroy all their metal statues. And demolish all their high places. Drive out the inhabitants of the land and live in it. For I have given the land to you to possess. You will inherit the land by lot, according to your families. You are to give more land to the larger families and less to the smaller ones. I'll do my best Obama impression. Whenever you, the lot falls to any particular person, that will be his property. You will inherit according to the tribes of your ancestors. But if you don't drive them out, the inhabitants of the land, from in front of you, then those you allow to remain will become like thorns in your eyes. And stings in your side. They will harass you in the land where you are living. And in the event, I will do to you what is intended to do to them. Amen? All right. Now, let's, let's take a look at that. Sometimes you get fun and because when you haven't had a nap, you need all that coffee. Your eyes are going, wee! Okay. So now, let's back up to verse 52. You are to expel the pe all the people living in in the land from in front of you, destroy all their stone figures, destroy all the metal, metal statues, and demolish all the high places. Amen? So here the Lord is telling the Israelites to expel the people living there because he knows that we're going to try to make friends with them as the Jews do today. Everybody has a right to do everything. No, they don't. Okay? Let's just get this straight. The Lord created everybody. He made borders for people. Okay, that's why building the wall, Trump is right. This is biblical. You know, when the Lord gave us part, he said, you know, divide up the land. Well, how do you think it was divided? You put a little line in the sand. Okay, so they put up borders. Okay, borders are good. It keeps, that's why the Lord made mountains. Okay, it does have a natural border. Okay, because the Lord wants us to expel the people, the pagans. Okay, the pagan Gentiles living in the land. Okay, from, and destroy all their stone statues, all the metal statues, demolish their high places. He wants it removed, and he wants us to see if he, we're going to do it, okay? And then verse 53 again, 
drive out the inhabitants of the land and live in it. For I have given the land to you to possess. Amen. So here the Lord is telling us, I want you to do this. Okay. Drive them out. Destroy them. Get rid of them. I don't want them in your house. Okay. It's one of the things that we even have to do ourselves. Okay. When you have people live, when you, you become unevenly yoked, okay, or, uh, you know, a, a family member um, comes back home, you know, say um, your son uh, gets married, and then, you know, he married a pagan woman, and then now he wants to come back, but he doesn't really want to do Shabbat, okay? You can't allow that in your land, in your home, in your apartment, okay? You got to think of yourself and your, wherever you live, whether it be a house, a farm, or a little apartment, okay, it's still your land. You're renting it. That's why you pay the landlord, okay? That's where you get the name from, landlord, okay? You can't allow those inhabitants to be in your midst. The Lord wants you to be separated. Once you put that mezuzah on your door, that place is supposed to be set apart, sanctified. So if somebody is living there, you got to, they're going to, what, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Let's look at verse 55. But if you don't drive out the inhabitants of the land from in front of you, then those you allow to remain will become like thorns in your eyes and stings in your sides. They will harass you in the land where you're living. Amen? So there you see, a, uh, I think that's a rose bush, the picture uh, of the very thorny uh, branch. Now, it's amazing how, how sharp, they are, okay, how the Lord grows them. But imagine this. This is amazing because the Lord does something really, really harsh here. He said, then those you allow to remain with will become like thorns in your eyes. Imagine that picture that you're looking at. Imagine that picture. And that a thorn, I mean, people get an eyelash and they're like, ah, ah, ah. You know, you get a piece of sand, you're at the beach and the wind blows and you're like, ah, or, you know, you get ragweed and you're like, ah, okay, okay. Now imagine a thorn in your eye. The Lord is trying to give you a picture, okay, that if you don't get rid of these people, no, but they're nice people. They, you know, these Muslim people are nice. They need a place to live here in America. No, they don't. Okay? They're going to be thorns in our eyes because they don't think like we do. They don't care about their children. They don't have our philosophy. They don't love the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. This land of America was founded on Judeo-Christian values. It was founded on the Bible. And if you don't believe that, read the letters of the Puritans, okay? You know, well, you drove out the Indians. Well, they didn't want Torah, okay? Solomon brought ships here with the Phoenicians, and that's why you find in the Los Lunas Rock in New Mexico, you see the Ten Commandments in Paleo-Hebrew, okay? Uh, you know, so here, the Lord says, drive out the inhabitants little by little. That's what we did in America. We got the first colonies, and then we tried to make friends with the people, but then they attacked us with the First Nations people, who were nations themselves, were fighting amongst themselves. So the Lord said, I'll give you the land little by little, just like Israel, okay? But once you allow that type of behavior to be, well, they're not really bad people. My mother used to say, what somebody does in their house is their own thing. We're not to tell people what to do in their house. Okay, well, that's, if that's not going to affect me, then I, then I can sort of understand it a little bit. But in the news tomorrow, you're going to see that sexually transmitted diseases are skyrocketing here in America, and especially among the gay population, especially the men gay, they have gonorrhea. And who's paying for all that in health care? Okay. So, and I'm going to read you a bunch of numbers, and if you want the report, send a... Uh, uh, email to info at bethgoim.org, info at bethgoim.org. But the Lord is saying here, get rid of them because he knows us. He knows that, you know, we're, we're all basically good people, okay? But he knows that that, that little Chiquita is going to make your banana. And you're going to make Chiquita banana, okay? And he doesn't want that. He doesn't want us mixing with the nations because he knows, because remember, this is after Balaam and Balak. He knows that we are going to gravitate to that. We're going to gravitate to that. 
We're going to leave the Lord behind and then he's going to have to give us over to our enemies. Okay? So that really is the issue. That is the issue. Look at verse uh, 55 again, then we'll move on. But if you don't drive out the inhabitants of the land from in front of you, then those you allow to remain will become like thorns in your eyes and stings in your side. They will harass you in the land where you're living. Amen? So now let's look at the stings in your side. If you have something in your side, every time you take a breath, it's going to hurt. And most people breathe anywhere between 12 and 24 times a minute. So every breath you take, every step you make, the Lord is going to be putting that thorn in your side. So he's saying, don't allow this in your, your land. This is why we have to stand for the Bible. And when some atheist doesn't want us to pray, you say, you come to our state, we're going to hang you from a tree. Okay, there was a, a superintendent in Texas this week that just make a law. We outlaw atheism. So if you bring a lawsuit against us, you must have the person's name because we're going to go visit them. And we're going to make them get fired. And we're gonna, not going to allow this type of garbage in our nation anymore. No matter where you live. See, the laws of God are not exclusive to just the Hebrew people. So wherever you live, if you start a community that follows Torah, little by little, the Lord will give you over Give it oh, that land over to you. Okay? If you follow these things, if you make your community, you get involved in politics. Some people can be involved in politics and, and get involved in that. People of honor and dignity like this Judge Roy Moore, the Ten Commandment judge who won the Alabama Senate seat the other day. And his interception speech, he was talking all about God. Good job there, Judge. Now give me a call and I'll make your education a little further because you're right there. You just got to make another step and then you'll be raised up even higher. Okay, so now we're talking about thorns. We're talking about thorns. Now hold your place there in Bamidbar and turn to Luke 8. Luke 8 verse 14. You learning something? Good. Luke 8 verse 14, we're talking about thorns. As for what fell among in the midst of thorns, these are the ones who hear, but as, as they go along, worries of wealth and life's gratifications crowd in and choke them so that their fruit never matures. Amen? Okay? This is um, people who uh, compromise the word. Okay? When you compromise the word, it's like a thorn in your side or a thorn in your eyeball. Okay? Because you're, you're balancing your life. You're trying to please man. You're trying to please pagan families. You're trying to please people instead of who you should be trying to please is God and God alone. Okay? And Yeshua gives this parable of the four seeds. This, is, this particular verse that we're reading is the third seed. Okay? The third seed is really most of the body of Messiah. They, they, they go so far and they compromise the word and then they compromise one thing and they compromise another thing and they compromise a third thing and pretty soon they're, they're worrying about wealth and they're worried about life's gratifications and then just chokes them off. Why? Because you comp compromise the word of God. Okay, so once you understand the thorn reference, in the number scripture, you understand why Yeshua chose the word thorns, okay? That those people that you want to try to please will become a thorn in your eye. You're supposed to get rid of them. Once you understand the Lord, you might have been in a pagan Christian church, you know, Sunday worshiping, ham eating, Christmas tree loving, bunny egg eating, you know. Once you learn the truth, okay, you got to get those thorns out of your sight or out of your side because they will make you compromise the word of God. And this is that third grouping of seeds that Yeshua is talking about. Once you understand what happened in Numbers, welcome to Beth Goyim. Okay, once you understand, wait, wait till you hear tomorrow's message. Okay, because I didn't know this was here. I forgot that this was here and it made the message in section one, number one. Okay, so here, once you understand Numbers, then you understand, because remember, Yeshua's there. And when he's trying to draw the people of Israel, his Talmudim, back to the proper ways. Okay? 
And he's, you, you want, I mean, all of us love our family. Well, most of us. Although I got a great blessing that I got to tell you about later. <laughs> a 10-year-old blessing. Um, or longer than that. You know, but most of us want to see our whole family saved. Most of us want, to, want them to know the joy. Like, that's what I miss. You know, like, not, not that I ever got along with my sister. I got along with my, my uh, stepbrother a little bit after my dad died and my mother got remarried. And I would love them to have experienced this joy that I have talking about the Lord. Loving the Lord, studying his word, and seeing the things that are going on in the, in the world. But after a while, when they don't want to be together with you, they become thorns in your side. And is it easy to leave them? No. But you have to understand that there is an eternity. And they will draw you away from God. They will draw you away from the holy days. They will draw you away from Shabbat. They will draw you away and you'll compromise and worries on what your family thinks will drive you to please them over God. Amen? All right, let's move on to the next slide. Let's go back to what Israel is supposed to be. Numbers 34, verse 1 and 2. Numbers 34, verse 1 and 2. The questions are after them. We will take questions after the recording is done. But write it down. There's probably a notebook in front of you somewhere. Look in the seats. Numbers 34, verse 1 and 2. You see a map there. Jehovah told Moshe to give this order to the people of Israel. When you enter the land of Canaan, it will become your land to pass on as an inheritance. The land of Canaan as defined by these borders. Amen? So when people say, when dumb Christians say, and even misled Jews and Messianics say, there should be no borders. Well, God says otherwise. Okay? God truly says otherwise. Okay? Now, in this picture, when you, when you look at when the borders are given, I want you to understand, okay, look at the picture, and you see the little purple thing? That's Israel. That's Israel today, uh, along with the little white part. They captured that in its uh, six-day war. They captured all of the wet... Uh, uh, the West Bank, all right? Now, that's Israel. But Israel, you see Iraq, the, the uh, light green part where the Tigris and the Euphrates River are? Israel was supposed to go all the way out there. They were also supposed to go down to uh, where Saudi Arabia was and the, the, the Sinai Peninsula, the dark green, okay? Israel was supposed to be part of where Syria is, Beirut, Jordan, Lebanon, okay? Um, not Beirut, Lebanon. Sorry, I'm looking at the capital. Okay, Israel was supposed to be a lot larger than it is today. Now, the question is, and I asked the kids in theology this week, you know, why do you think God only gave us this little part? It's a heart issue. See, um, you know, sometimes I get to talk to my wife, and we get into really good discussions uh, about the Word. You know, it's one of the things about having a believing wife that's a wonderful thing. And we're talking about you know, there's so many people, like if we, if we move to Israel, you know, one, to find a job is ridiculously hard. That's why they get so much into internet because then you're not as small as Israel is. But the people living in the land are not coming back like, if I were to go live in the land, I'd want to go to worship God in my home country, okay? I was born here, but my family comes from Israel, okay? The people that are coming back don't want to worship God in spirit and in truth. They're coming back because France is a terrible place. They're afraid of the Muslims in France. They're afraid of the Muslims in Britain. Okay, they're afraid of the Muslims, and even they're afraid of the Christians, the Catholics, in Poland. Okay, and they're afraid of the Protestants in Ireland. Okay, the Jews are coming back, but they're not coming back for the right reasons. Okay, but if we were to come back for the right reasons, then the Lord would give us back our land. Okay, he would move them out for us. Okay, so you see, when we went into the land, when we made it past the 40 years, and that next generation came in, this was supposed to be the land. It was huge, okay? It's a huge piece of property that God gave us, and lots of oil, and you know, you see where Kuwait is, where all the oil is? That was supposed to be ours! 
This was be ours. But you guys blew it. See, if we just serve God in spirit and truth, he would give us the riches of the world. But we mess up. Okay? So here... Uh, make sure you, you look at good at that map because Israel's supposed to be a lot larger than it is. But no, most people don't realize how large it's supposed to be. So that's why I showed you the map. Well, maps, let's go on to the next slide. Let's go to Numbers 34, verse 16 and 17. I'm only going to do one grouping of names. Okay? In uh, chapter 34 and I believe 35, there's a whole bunch of names which we've done one year. And it's a fun thing because you see... When you, when you look at, let me read verse 16 and 17. I'm going to show you something. And then I'll show you how you can get deeper into the word of God. When, you know, instead of watching Dancing with the Stars or Game of Thrones or whatever stupid television you show you're watching, what video game you're playing or whatever that is, to study the word of God is once you start getting into le levels of understanding, it really is a book, oh, the Bible is an amazing book. The more you study it, the more knowledge there is, the more blessings it is. Numbers 34, but Midbar 34, you want my glasses? Verse 16 through 17. Okay? I can really see now. Look, I can see. Wow, you have hair on your face. Jehovah said to Moshe, these are the names of the men who will take possession of the land for you. Eleazar the Cohen and Yehoshua the son of Nun. Amen? So you see three names in verse 17. As you're reading through chapter 34, you'll see groupings of names. That really is a sentence. Okay, it's a sentence. Once you figure out what the names mean, okay, so Eleazar is the first name. Eleazar means God has helped. God has helped. Okay, Yehoshua, okay, is the second name. Yehoshua, it means Jehovah is salvation. Okay, then the third uh, name is Nun. Okay, N U N, N U N. Okay. Uh, that means fish. God has helped. Jehovah is salvation, the son of the fish. Okay? So what the Lord is having here is God has helped the Cohen, Eleazar. God has helped the Cohen, and Jehovah is our salvation, the son of the fisherman. Okay? So you got to put, you know, the endings on it. But once you see the framework, you're like, wow. So that's level one. And if you were to then take Eleazar in the Hebrew and then see what it begins with, and how many letters it is, then you start going into Gematria. You see it builds and builds and builds. And you're like, nobody could have actually put this together and thought it's, it's amazing. So then you put the Eleazar, the number of Eleazar, then Yehoshua, and none, you put that together, and what number that forms, and what, it's, it's amazing, okay? In this uh, section, you'll see a lot of names. If you want to have some fun and really see what God is saying in these sentences, like I said, Eliezer, God is help, Yehoshua, Jehovah is salvation, and uh, uh, none, the fish, or poster, uh, posterity, okay? So God is help, the Kohen, Yehovah is, is salvation, the son of of the fisherman. Yehoshua, that's where you get Yeshua's name from. It's a derivative. Yeshua is a derivative of Yehoshua. Okay? So he was in the tent with Moses the whole time, the son of the fisherman. Bada bing. All right. Going on to the next slide. Chapter 35 now, verse 6 and 7. So I'm going to show you a little bit about the Gematria, okay? And um, what numbers mean in Hebrew. Numbers 35, verse uh, 6 and 7. The cities to give to the Litvayim are to be six cities of refuge, to which you permit the person who kills someone to flee to, plus an additional 42 cities. Thus you will give them, uh, give the Litvayim 48 cities with their surrounding open land. Amen? So in this city, in these cities of refuge, you first start with the first number, six, okay? Six, then you would then look up 42, 42, what letters that would be, because in Hebrew, there is no numbers, okay? It is letters, Aleph, Aleph through Yod is one through 10, and then you do uh, 10 plus whatever, 
And then you do with the next numbers. Twenty would shh. I can hear you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're just going to look for this parash. We're going to look for this parash is the number six. Okay, uh, so what does the number six mean? The bi in the Bible, the number six symbolizes man and human weakness. Okay, so here it's a city of refuge, so there's some sort of weakness. It's about man uh, and the cities of refuge, so there's some sort of weakness. Why are you going to that? Something occurred. It could have been an accident, but it's weakness. Okay, um, the evils of Satan and the manifestation of sin. Okay, because man ate of the fruit in the, in the garden. He heard the word of God and he chose to sin because Satan tricked him, but he should have known better and should have went to the Lord, but he did not. Okay, man was created on the sixth day. Okay, so the number six is about man, human weakness, sin, and he was created on the sixth day where you would get a double portion. So here if the city is a refuge, you're getting a double portion because you're getting an opportunity to refuge, refuge there until we find out what occurred. Okay? Uh, men are appointed to work six days of labor. Avodah. Work six days. Avodah is work and worship. Okay? A Hebrew slave is to work six full years. But on the seventh day, year, he is released on, uh, uh, from his uh, slavery. Okay? Six years, you are to sow the land. Six years, you are to sow the land. And then on the seventh year, <clears throat> it is a Shemitah. So six is what we're looking at here in verse 5. Again, the cities to give to the living are the six cities of refuge to which a person who kills someone to flee to plus an additional 42. So the six is man, sin, creation, Work, slavery, okay? So once you start learning that, you understand why the Lord gave six cities. Because it's about man, his weaknesses, because of sin that is in the world, the creation that we are, but we're now broken. You're appointed to work six days, okay? And here, a Hebrew slave, because you're in sin, you're a slave, you work six full years. So here, that once you start getting that in your mind, then you understand why it's six cities. It has more understanding than, well, it was six cities. No, God never does things on just that low level. He does it for the beginners. Six cities, okay, well, okay, six cities, okay? Now, once you start understanding and your, your knowledge with the Lord, you then go, okay, why six? Why 42? How is 42 spelled? What letters are those? What do the letters mean? Okay, the second letter is a bait, 42. Okay, Aleph bait. So the bait is a doorway. Okay, what does a doorway mean? Okay, once you find out in the Hebrew the first letter, and you start building on that, and that's why the Jews, you see them studying the Word of God all week long, all day long. You know, we can't get most people to hear, and even, you know, online to you know, read every single day. But to study is to understand that there is a God in heaven and there's magnificent understandings in that. Okay? Now, when we move to the next slide, I think it, uh, with the number six. I don't know if it's on the same slide as, it, as that. The sixth commandment in the Ten Commandments is the sin of murder. The sixth commandment is uh, the sin of murder. Then the sixth clause of the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, okay, Petitions that we are not led into sin and delivered from evil. So here, even in the formulated prayer that Yeshua did, he was, he was so amazing that, he, you know, the six, the number of city, and the number of the commandment. So here, lead us not into sin. Okay? Um, the third part, the world turned dark beginning at the sixth hour in Hebrew at noon when Messiah was on the cross in the sixth hour. Okay, on our website, there's a chart of the hours. So if you look for it, you'll, you'll find it. And you're like, well, when was that hour? It tells you. Okay. And Yeshua suffered on the cross for, for six hours. From nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. Six hours. So now you take all that 
understanding, and then you bring it back to numbers, and you're like, all right, that's amazing. Six cities, the sixth commandment, the sixth clause of the prayer, dark began in the sixth hour, and Yeshua was on the cross for the six, six hours. It goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay, that's why we study the prosh. And each year, you know, people get bored with it sometimes. I'm like, you, you don't love God. You know, you compromise the word. Because the more you study, then you start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And you're like, wow, 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 Lord. And you see the, the grandness of the Father. And the more, you, you, the more I see him, the more I'm amazed. Okay, the more, it's like, if you, you, believe, you don't believe that there's a God, you're an idiot. Going on to the next slide. Go back to Numbers 35, verse 9 through 12. Numbers 35, verse 9 through 12. Jehovah said to Moshe, Tell the people of Israel when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, you are to designate for yourself cities that will be cities of refuge for you to which anyone who kills someone by mistake can flee. The cities are to be a refuge for you from the dead person's next of kin who might otherwise avenge a kinsman's death by slaying the killer prior to his standing trial before the community. Amen? So here the cities of refuge are a place that the person stays until he gets trial. Okay, you kill somebody by accident, well, we need a trial. We have to find out what happened. Okay, the person might be stoned to death after that. But here, what if it was a mistake? Then we go into what happens in this parash. What happens to that person if it's found not guilty? But you still don't get to live your life because you, you should have taken better care. Like, you know, the axe handle. The axe flies off the handle. Okay? And it impales in Brittany's head. Nothing really happened because her head is so hard. Okay? <laughs> uh, so anyway, no, then it bounced off her head and hit Tristan and then still didn't do anything. Okay, so here, if you make a mistake, that's why this parash is about mistakes. The Lord is always wanting to try to fix things for us, and he gives us ways to fix it. Okay, the word mistake here in Hebrew is shegaga, uh, shin, gimel, gimel, hey, shegaga. It means to sin, sin of error. Inadvertent, inadvertent sin, okay? Okay, it's an accident. It's not like you're thinking, I'm going to hide behind the wall. As soon as that person comes around, I'm going to shoot them in the head, okay? No, it's an accident, okay? If you're thinking of doing that, you know, killing somebody, then that's murder because you thought about it, okay? So the Lord is talking about inadvertent errors, and all you have to do is then back up that we've done to the other parashas. I think it's on the next slide, Tristan. Leviticus 4.2, 4.13, and 4.22 all have the word inadvertent or shegaga, okay? A mistake, okay? Inadvertent error, okay? The Lord has in Leviticus chapter 4 and chapter 5 inadvertent errors, okay? Once you learn the truth, you let the truth set you free, okay? But don't keep going to make an error. That's why Yeshua said to the woman, okay, they didn't follow procedure, but I know you're in sin, so he says, don't sin anymore. Don't sin anymore. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Let's go to 35 verse 16. Thirty-five, sixteen. However, if he hits him with an iron implement, thus causes his death, he is a murderer. And the murderer... Murderer, red rum, must be put to death. Okay? Okay? So there you see a nice picture of a really nice guy. Che, has, okay? He had a scraggly looking beard, and he really didn't have a mustache, and he's dead. Okay? But he's holding a, a shovel. Okay? So if somebody takes a shovel, so the Lord is saying, if you use an iron implement to hit somebody, Okay, unless they're trying, now if they're trying to kill you, that's a different story. That's self-defense, and the Lord allows us self-defense. But if you just pick up a shovel, and somebody's coming around the wall, bang, on the head, the Lord says, you're a murderer, and you must be put to death. 
So those people that don't believe in the, the death penalty in America, okay, well, the death penalty was impl implemented because we were following the Bible. Now, are there corrupt judges and corrupt things? Yeah. Are there occasional people that die? Um, yeah. But on the whole, no. Okay. People are in jail because they've done something wrong. Okay. And, if you know, whatever the, the cause may be. And if you kill me, hey, I'm happy. I'm done. I finished the race. Okay. But here the Lord is saying, if you think about it and then you pick up a shovel, bang, on the head or in the stomach and the person dies, you're a murderer. And here in God's land and his ways, and if you think that the death penalty is wrong, take it up with God. I don't suggest doing that, but go ahead. I'll stand over here. Going on to the next slide. Verse 17. Numbers 35, verse 17. Or if he hits him with a stone in his hand big enough to kill someone, and he dies, he's a murderer, the murderer must be put to death. Okay? Now people say, well, David hit Goliath with a stone. Well, Goliath was trying to kill him. Okay? So uh, I've heard, you imagine the things I hear. Okay? So there you see a really cool picture. This looks like, you know, it's a big stone that's round, so it's been uh, shaped. Okay? So if you hit uh, somebody with a stone big enough to kill someone, okay, a little stone is not, usually not big enough to kill somebody. But if you take a big stone that's in your hand and you, you're fighting and you bash somebody in the head, you crush their cranium, uh, that's murder, the Lord is saying. Okay, if you want to fight, fight hand to hand. If not, run away. Okay, so the Lord wants a fair, even fight. But if you use the thing, he's using something, then you get to use something yourself because you can defend yourself. Okay, because people say, well, we as believers shouldn't have guns. Well, we don't shoot first unless we're, they're pointing a gun at us. Okay, and after pointing a gun at us, I'm going to empty my clip into your body. Okay, well, maybe not. I don't want to waste bullets. Okay, but here the Lord is saying... If the rock is big enough to kill somebody and he dies, you are a murderer and you will pay the price with your own life. Okay? Going on to the next slide. These are pretty self-explanatory, but you must tell them. Because especially if you're teaching children, you know, um, I had a sort of story this last week about somebody taking a baseball bat to somebody in the back. You know, that's cowardly. Okay? You want to fight somebody? Go face to face. Don't be Palestinian. Don't be a Muslim coming up from behind. Come up to me face to face and face your... Go ahead. Make my day. Verse 18 now. Verse 18. Or if he hits him with a wood utensil in his hand capable of killing someone and he dies, he's a murderer, the murderer must be put to death. Amen? So if you take a Louisville slugger, okay, that is a wooden utensil, okay, it's supposed to be used for baseball, okay, it's a nice baseball bat, okay, um... And it's capable of killing somebody, you better have a good reason because you're going to be able to flee to the city of refuge and then you're going to be able to tell your story that the guy was coming after you with a knife and you picked up a stick and you beat him in the head first. Okay? But you have witnesses for you. But if you, the person doesn't have anything, okay, if you pick up a stick then or a bat or some sort of wood utensil, you are in the wrong. But if you're being attacked, you are not in the wrong. Okay, so understand the Lord wants a fair, even fight between people. He doesn't want us to fight at all, but if you don't want, the, don't use the, the, the metal shovel, don't use the, the rock, don't use the wood, okay? Unless you're being attacked, then it's a different story. Going on to the next slide. Verse 29 and 30. Numbers 30, uh, 35, verse 29 and 30. These things shall constitute your standard for judgment though through all your generations, wherever you live. If anyone kills someone, the murderer is to be put to death upon the testimony of witnesses. But if the testimony of only one witness, witness will not suffice to cause a person to be put to death. Amen. So there you see in the picture, the guy putting his hand on the Bible and, and then put, raising his hand to tell the truth, nothing but the truth to help you God. And if you ever have to go to court, what you say to this, and you don't say, I swear, you say, amen. 
because you're a follower of Jehovah and the son Yeshua. Of course I'm going to tell the truth because I believe in the Ten Commandments. Do you? Okay, so you say amen. That's what, you know, so you're not swearing, you're just agreeing. Amen means I agree with whatever you just said. Okay, but here, to be put to death, you must have two witnesses. Now, if you have a recording of it, that's your witnesses because that's like two eyes, okay, and not, not middle of the recording, okay, from the beginning, okay. Now, yeah, look at verse 30 again. If anyone kills somebody, the murderer is to be put to death upon the testimony of witnesses. But the testimony of only one witness will not suffice to cause a person to be put to death. Amen? So this is very important. Because if you're caught in adultery, that's why you know, people say, well, David should have been put to death. Okay? Where are the witnesses? Who brought the charge against David and Bathsheba? All right, nobody brought the charge. Had two people brought the charge, David would be dead. But nobody came forth. That's why he was not put to death. Because the Torah must be kept. Did he do wrong? Yes. And did Bathsheba and David lose their child? Yes. Okay, he paid the ultimate price, but he didn't get put to death. Okay, imagine n knowing that you, you're, you were the cause of your child dying. He had to live with that the rest of his life. Okay? Uh, hopefully the child is in heaven, but the Lord knows the plans he had for you. And Jeremiah, okay? But you must have not just one witness. You must have two witnesses, and the story must be the same. Okay, then you can put the person to death. So here we should still follow this, okay? If there's two witnesses that have the same story, or we got a camera, you know, like we see a lot of the police, unfortunately, we're living in a, a society that doesn't follow rules, when the cop says, leave your hands on the steering wheel, don't take your hands off the steering wheel. Cop tells you to do something. It's a wise decision because he has the gun and handcuffs. Okay? Or you pay the ultimate price. The cop said, freeze. Can I move now? Okay? Okay? And if he's doing something bad, let him beat you, and then you'll be rich because you find a good Jewish lawyer, and don't worry, you'll win. Okay? All right, now, with the two witnesses, turn to John. Hold your place there. Turn to John 8, verse 17 to 19. John 8, 17 to 19. John 8, 17 to 19. John 8, Yochanan 8, verse 17 to 19. And even in your Torah, it is written that the testimony of Two people is valid. I myself testify on my own behalf, and so does the Father who sent me. They said to him, Where is the Father, this Father of yours? Yeshua answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father too. Amen? So the two witnesses, Yeshua and his Father, witness of Yeshua's Messiahship. Okay, this also plays in to John 8, where they bring the woman in adultery. Where were the witnesses? Okay, because adultery is a toeba. It means an abomination before the Lord, and you do stone the woman and the man to death. One, you need both people, okay, and you need witnesses, okay? You need not just one witness, you need two witnesses. Then it is a full understanding, and then you, you take the life of the person, okay? Going on to the next slide. Go back to Numbers 35, verse 31. Numbers 35, Bamidbar 35, verse 31. You are not to accept a ransom in lieu of a life of a murderer condemned to death. Rather, he must be put to death. Amen? So here, um, you know, the Lord wrote this law because he knew people would accept money to not put the person to death. Okay? Because the crime and corruption going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Gone to den. Okay? So here, if you accept ransom in lieu of a life, then you must be put to death. Okay? It's a very interesting thing. So you accept that bag of money, and all those $100 bills, that would be kind of nice, kind of really nice to have a whole, you know, that's got to be a good certain amount of money there. 
and buy us a building. If anybody's got a couple of million, hey, like to buy a building, you know, five million, five hundred thousand, you know, something like that will do, okay? But you are not to accept, so don't become part of it. It says don't become part of this evil scheme, okay? Do not be from, become part of it. Now here, with that money, with the ransom, all right, go hold your place there in, in Bamidbar, go to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verse 3 through 6. Matthew 27, verse 3 through 6. Matthew 27. When Yehuda, who had betrayed him, saw that Yeshua had been condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the head Kohanim and elders, saying, I had sinned in betraying an innocent man to death. What is that to us? They answered, that is your problem. Hurling the pieces of silver into the sanctuary, he left, then he went off and hanged himself. The head Kohanim took the silver coins and said, it is prohibited to put this into the temple treasury because it is blood money. Amen? So here they're saying it's blood money. They're, they're going to be put to death. They could be put to death because of the law. Yehuda gave the money back. He knew he didn't made a mistake. So it's a, an error. Okay? And he can be re redeemed, but he hung himself. He murdered himself. So that means he's in hell. Okay? You commit suicide, you're going to hell. Period. End of story because that's murder. Okay? Don't accept the ransom. But he didn't. He was a greedy man. He was walking with the Lord. He saw miracles. And that's what a lot. Of, when you compromise your values, when you compromise these values, then you accept the bribe. Well, you know, the guy, the guy was going to die anyway. You rationalize. Okay. Going on to the next slide. Back to Numbers 36, verse 2. And three, numbers 36, verse 2 and 3. Okay, a couple more, two more slides. Two more slides. Well, three more slides. But two more scriptures. Numbers 36, Bamidbar 36, verse 2 and 3. Listen up, Brittany. Because you had this question the other day, last week. Yes, you asked me something. Okay. They said, Jehovah ordered my Lord to give by lot the land of the, of the, to be inherited by the people of Israel. And my Lord was ordered by Jehovah to give the inheritance of our kinsmen, Zelophechad, to his daughters. But if they get married to anyone belonging to another of the tribes of the people of Israel, then their inheritance will be taken away from, from the inheritance of our ancestors and be added to the inheritance of the tribe they will belong to. Thus, it will be taken away from the sum total of our inheritance. Amen? So you understand that? Or should I explain it? Okay. Okay. So Brittany was asking this question. It's a good question. Remember the daughters of Zelophechad got the inheritance because their father had no sons. But what it's saying is when they get married in verse 3, when they get married in verse 3, anyone belonging to another, if they get married to another tribe, okay? So if you get married to somebody who's a different tribe, okay, uh, the people of Israel, then the inheritance will be taken away from uh, the, our inheritance of our ancestors and be added to the inheritance of the tribe. So then it would go to your, your next of kin in your family. So it stays, that land stays in the, tri in the tribe, but if you marry outside of your tribe, then it m goes, then you become the property of that husband. So let's say you're from Levi. Now, uh, Asher. Asher, you're an Asherite uh, because you like to cook. Or maybe you're Yisachar because you're strong like a donkey. I've seen you kick. Okay? So Yisachar, uh, you're not a what? Shimon? No, no, no. We're going with Asher. Okay, Brittany's from Asher. And she marries somebody from the tribe of Benjamin. You, re you release that, that inheritance to... Mia would be next, unless there's a Eduardito. Okay, okay. Then Eduardito gets everything because he's a boy. Okay, so 
but you understand because that was a good question you had, and it's right here in the scripture the next week because you asked it last week. And here you go on to the next part. All right, let's go on to the next thing. We'll go another two more minutes, so we finish the prosh. Go to verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7, here's what Jehovah had ordered concerning the daughters of Lovacad. Let them be married to whomever they think best. But they must marry only into a family from their father's tribe. In this way, no inheritance of the people of Israel will move from one tribe to another. For each of the people of Israel is to hold on to the land for the inheritance belongs to his father's tribe. Amen? So they, you can marry whoever you want uh, in this way, but, um, but they, they must marry into the family from their father's tribe. Okay? So if you marry outside the tribe, okay, you marry an Israelite or a Hebrew, you can't be unevenly yoked on anybody who's getting married. Okay? That's first and foremost. You must marry a, a follower of Yeshua, a Sabbath keeper, one who follows Torah. Okay? Uh, but here... The Lord is wanting us to marry inside the tribe, inside the tribe, okay? So the inheritance stays inside the tribe, so the tribe grows. So it's good that you meet somebody inside the tribe, and then you marry inside the tribe. That's why you have, we have congregational life and stuff like that. So we're talking about inheritance and getting the inheritance, all right? Go to our final scripture, turn to Yochanan 10. Yochanan 10. Verse 27 through 30, looking on 10, John 10, verse 27 through 30. My sheep listen to my voice. I recognize them. They will follow me. I will give them, the eternal, uh, give them eternal life. They will absolutely never be destroyed, and no one will snatch them from my hands. My Father who gave them to me is the greater than all, and no one can snatch them from the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Amen? The key verse to this and why we're talking about inheritance is verse 30. Yeshua said, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. All right? Meaning that he, he gets the inheritance of, from his Father. So his Father created the universe. Okay? And then he gets the inheritance. That's why he said in Matthew 28 that uh, all heaven and earth belong to me. Now let's go to the next slide, the final slide, John 19, verse 19. John 19, verse 19. Yoke 19, last slide, hopefully you've learned anything. If you have, please hit the doggone donate button, okay? Five cents, five dollars, five thousand dollars, five million. Just keep adding the zeros. If you got it, give it good. Okay, and if you missed any part of this, go to Messianic Student. It'll be up there on Wednesday if I get to it this week because we do a lot of stuff. And if not, just get us on YouTube, BGMC TV. Okay, John 19, verse 19. Pilate also, know, had, a, also had a notice written and posted on the stake, the cross. It read, Yeshua from Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Okay, Yeshua HaMelech Baha Yehudi. Okay, when you take the first letter, of each one of those words, Yeshua HaMelech uh, Bahai Yehudi. Okay, you take the first letter of that, that's yod Hey vav Hey. That is the ineffable name of God, and that ties together uh, with the first line of Scripture, Bereshit Bara Elohim Eit HaShemayim Va'et Ha'aretz. The Aleph and the Tav, the middle word, the one, two, three, four, the fourth word, Aleph and Tav, is the owner of all things. Okay? And the eight is the owner of ha, the sixth word is the owner of the fifth word and the seventh word. Okay, the eight, the nail that puts everything together, the Aleph and the Tab, owns Hashemayim and Ha'aretz. That's why Yeshua said, I and the Father are one. He gets the inheritance and we're part of his family. Well, that's all the time we have and we finish the parash. So, I bid you a beautiful, if you're celebrating Yom Kippur because you're across the international date line, all right, that's a good thing. If not, well, wait till tomorrow. And I bid you an amen, and an amen, and an amen. Shalom, this is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to The Remnant's Call each and every week. You can listen to the full message on our website, bethgoyim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about him today, 
we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. And click on the donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to The Remnants Call. If you have not taken your first steps to be born again, just ask God's help. Remember, it's His loving grace that has come to find you. No one is worthy or able to reach God, but God can reach us, and He's reaching out to you now. Just open your heart and let Him in. His arms are open, and the blessing of salvation and eternal life are waiting for you. Don't let it wait any longer. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his shalom. Shalom. My name is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman, and I invite you to come to visit our congregation. If you are in the tri-state area, come out and visit with us on Shabbat. We are a congregation of Jews and Gentiles, living as one in the Messiah Yeshua. BGMC is a place of true worship. The focus never wanders from the Hebraic roots of our faith. Beth Goyim is rooted in the Word of God from Bereshit through to the book of Revelation. Messiah's strong words against man-made tradition are carefully recorded in Matthew 7. That is the reason we only follow the straight-up instructions found in Scripture, truly the way, the truth, and the life. If you're looking for a deeper walk with Adonai, come out for our Tuesday evening Bible study called Messianic Torah Time. Come, spend the day with us on any Shabbat. We start at 11 a.m. with the sound of the ancient Hebrew shofar. Next, we offer our King praise and worship in English, Hebrew, and Spanish. After worship, we review the headlines in the previous week's news from around the globe, especially news from the Holy Land, Israel. We don't just list the news headlines as current events, but we comb through the scriptures searching for clues to understand what they mean and then to help pinpoint prophetically our current position on Adonai's clock. After digesting all that modern information, we leave the world behind as we journey with our Adonai deep into his eternal word, not with just one or two scriptures, but usually seven or more scriptures. The spiritual nourishment and the richness of his kingdom become accessible to the ones who share this special time and seek them out. The day does not end there. Because Shabbat is so special to him, there is always so much more that our king desires to share. So instead of separating and leaving, we stay together as a family for potluck lunch and an afternoon study of our king's word. We close this Shabbat together with a reading of the New Week's Parashah. That's the Torah portion. Even after those blessings, many of us just can't get enough. So the members bring prepared homemade foods to share while we all enjoy an uplifting movie together. If all that information is not quite enough, you can check out our website where you will find over 200 video teachings and Biblical Holy Day studies. Under Messianic Torah Time, the Hebrew Roots button, you'll discover free studies on many, many different topics, including PowerPoint slide presentations. If Beth Goyim sounds like a place you'd love to visit, but you live outside the tri-state area, there is still a way to connect with us. We stream live on the internet on Tuesday, Thursday, and Shabbat. The website is www.bethgoyim.org. 
That's B E T H G O Y I M dot org. Our phone number is 973 338 7800 or 978 2 Yeshua. That's 978, the number 2 Yeshua. Shalom. Shalom.